Okay. Okay. So proprietary estoppel is the second part of our discussion today. Uh, it's an estoppel by acquiescence or encouragement. Uh, when you say proprietary estoppel, that's related to the ownership or proprietorship of the land. Um, this is a long judgment in the case of Ramsden and Dyson, uh, where Lord Kingsdown, Kingsdown said that if a man under a verbal agreement with a landlord for certain interest in land or what amounts to the same thing under the expectation created or encouraged by the landlord that he shall have interest take possession of such land with the consent of the landlord upon the faith of such promise or expectation with the knowledge of the landlord and without the objection by him lays out money upon the land, a court of equity will compare the landlord to give effect to such promise or expectation. It's a long quote, right? Um, if you read the quote slowly, then you may be able to identify um, the important elements of uh, proprietary estoppel. If a man under a verbal agreement with a landlord for a certain interest in land under, the expect under an expectation created or encouraged by the landlord. So number one, there must be a, a, an agreement, a verbal contract between, there must be a pro or verbal contract between the parties. Number two, that must involve element of expectation that what a promise does what a tenant does or would do is based on the encouragement or expectation by the landlord. Okay. Number three, upon the faith of such promise or expectation lays out money upon the land. So that is what we call as reliance, where the promise um, has acted on the promise given by the landlord. So, lays out money is considered as an act of reliance of um, a conduct. Yeah? And that conduct, uh, sorry, that uh, transaction is not objected by the landlord. So, on this, um, the landlord, uh, the court may order the landlord to um, enforce the promise that he had made earlier with a tenant. Right, so this is the detailed elements. Number one, there must be a representation or assurance made to the claimant. Number two, there must be reliance. Number three, uh, there must be detriment on the claimant as a result of the reliance. The first element that there must be representation or assurance. So promise, um, if you look at any kind of estoppel, there must be a clear and unequivocal promise where um, the promisee must assure that um, the landlord promise to give proprietary interest to the promisee. Or you can say landlord and the tenant. Or you can say the trustor and the beneficiary. Or trustor, trustee and beneficiary. If you look at the cases, for instance, like in the case of Cheng Hang Guan, that case um, quite interesting. It's a, long, it's a long case. But that case shows that um, there is uh, assurance made by the old ancestor to the first generation and then to the sec to the second generation of the land. So the promise, the representation must be clear, must not be ambiguous. So if it is a express promise, much easier for us to uh, get it. Okay. If it is implied, then 
the plaintiff, the promisee, has to prove that there is an assurance that the claimant will acquire the proprietary interest in the property. Not necessarily land, it could be any kind of property, or like house, or like farm. Okay. In the case of Walton and Walton, there was a promise made by the mother to the son that he would inherit her farm in return, for which he left school early and had worked for low wages. So that is basically the promise. Um, she said that you cannot have more money and a farm one day. So he had to, the son had to quit the school and willing to work under for low wages or uh, willing to work underpaid in other words so that the mother can fulfill the promise. The son complied with the mother's promise but later the mother uh, denied the promise to the son. So the issue here is whether uh, the mother can be stopped from denying the promise that she had made to the son. The court held in this case, the Lord Justice Hoffman said that the promise must be clear and must have been intended to be taken seriously. Um, and it must have been a promise which might which one might reasonably expect to be relied upon by the prom by the person to whom it was made. So the mother had made the promise here, and the mother would expect that someone else here, the son, would rely on the promise and would take it seriously. It looks backward from the moment when the promise falls due to be performed and asks whether in the circumstances which have actually happened, it would be unquestionable for the promise not to be kept. Hence, the son succeeded in his claim. In this case, if you look at the promise here, the court said that uh, it would be unconscionable if the promise not to be kept because the son has showed reliance on the promise made by the mother. Therefore, the son was successful in the claim. Next case, Stoner and Marja. In this case, the appellant had worked on the uh, defendant's estate farm for over a decade without pay, believing that he would inherit the land when respondent died. When respondent, well, respondent once gave uh, appellant a bonus stating that it was for his death duties Respondent never explicitly told that the appellant would uh, inherit. Under the original will, the property would have passed to appellant, but respondent retracted his this will and died in that state. Uh, the appellant claimed that he should uh, inherit the property due to proprietary estoppel. So you got the fact, you correct, or you understand the facts? So basically, there was a promise uh, based on the conduct here that uh, based on the work done at the farm, he would believe that without pay, he would inherit the land when the respondent died. But the respondent denied the promise and died in testate. Died in testate means died without leaving any will. So the abandon invoked the doctrine of proprietary estoppel to claim his right. So here the issue is there was no explicit or clear assurance of the proprietary interests. Um, in deciding on this, the court uh, said that it is possible for a representation to meet by conduct alone as long as that conduct conveys the message to a reasonable person sufficiently clearly that the claimant was to have proprietary interest in the land. There may be a situation where um, it is the assurance is not made clearly by the promisor. So here, uh, the assurance or the, the representation is not made explicitly or clearly by the promisor. So here, the court said that you can also uh, look at the conducts of parties. So if you look at the conducts of the parties here, uh, where he had been willing to work at the farm without being paid. 
So that can show that he would have expected that he would inherit the, the land. So what the court will look at is basically the court will look at the all circumstances. The court will look at the all the facts related to the promise made by the promisor and the conduct of the promisee. Unquestionability doctrine here is applicable. So on this fact, the conduct gave a sufficiently clear representation of proprietary interest to give rise to estoppel. Therefore, the court held that A had established proprietary estoppel. Therefore, our respondent is estopped from denying the promise. Here, since R has died, so basically the action was taken by the next of kin or by the heirs of the family. Second element, there must be element of reliance by the claimant. So reliance here uh, is important to be proven so that to show the promises act has uh, been done based on the promise made by the promisor. In the case of Inwards and Baker, in this case, a father owned a land and persuaded his son to build a bungalow on it. So the issue here was whether the son had an equity over the land. The court held that all that is necessary is that the licensee should, at the request or without or with the encouragement of the landlord, have spent money in the expectation of having been allowed to stay there. So the construction of the bungalow here by the son was persuaded by the father, right? or by the encouragement of the father. Therefore, the father is stopped from going back to the promise and the son can have a um, right uh, in the bungalow or in the property. Because there is element of reliance by the son based on the encouragement, based on the expectation uh, made by the landlord, by the father. Right. In the case of Plima and the mayor, councillors and citizens of the city of Wellington, uh, Plima constructed a wharf on Crown Lands in Wellington Harbour. Uh, later, in 1855, the depth of the water had fallen. Plima made a jetty which stretched a considerable distance into the harbour. The land was later conveyed by the Crown to the provincial government. In 1856, Plymouth extended the jetty to a further 112 feet. He sought compensation when the land was to be vested in the defendant. So Plymouth constructed the wharf, water had fallen, he extended the JT, but later the land was given to uh, the provincial government. So he wants to claim his right over uh, the wharf, not to. Uh, so he he did that based on the promise made by the by the uh, by the municipal by the municipal council. The issue here is whether. Plima had occupied land under a revocable license from corporations' predecessors in title and at their request had made extensive improvement to it. So when the land, when the water depth has fallen, um, there was actually a promise made by the municipal council that uh, they had given him a revocable license, therefore he extended the JT. In this case, Uh, the court held that uh, Plima had occupied the land under a revocable license, but because of the 1856 event, there was a promise there that made the license irrevocable based on the... Uh, because of the conduct, Plima has uh, acted to extend the jetty based on the license given by the municipal council, but later they conveyed the, the wharf uh, to the government. So based on the 1856 event here, um, what Plima did was basically based on the assurance um, by the Municipal Council. Therefore, he had incurred, if you look at the first paragraph, he had incurred uh, expense at the request of the government, the owners of the land. 
Therefore, the government was not allowed or was stopped from denying the promise that he had made earlier to uh, Pima that he had, he can construct um, the extension of the jetty and he can have the irrevocable license over the jetty, over the wharf. Uh, next element is detriment to the claimant in consequence of his reasonable reliance. So the claimant must prove here that he suffered losses as a result of the reliance. In the case of Davy and Francis, um, the tenant had bought a house with the tenancy of the ground and had clear expectation of a right to purchase the land. Here, the court held that equity would prevent the landlord from terminating the tenancy on one month notice until and unless the land has been offered to the tenant to the purchase and he had refused. So here, um, the landlord um, the tenant had bought the house with a tenancy at the expectation or at the encouragement made by the landlord. So, but later the landlord terminate the tenancy. Here, the landlord is stopped from denying or from going back to his old promise unless the tenant himself refused to buy the house with the tenancy. Dia macam sewa beli lah, okay? So because of the offer made by the landlord, dia mula dia sewa, lepas tu dia beli. Lepas, but later during the tenancy, the landlord terminate the tenancy. Okay, so here, the promise, the earlier promise by the landlord is, is a sewa beli, okay? Sewa with tenancy. But later during the tenancy, the landlord terminate the tenancy. Here, the landlord is a stop from going back to the uh, uh, from the old promise unless the tenant himself refused to proceed with the um, purchase of the house. Right. Next case is the case of Cheng Hang Guan and Perumahan Farlim. In this case, the plaintiff's family had been staying on part of holding number 3532 and 2497 for more than 100 years, so more than one decade, basically. There were two dwelling houses, uh, that's the house numbers, or the house uh, plots, basically, and their vegetable farm on the land. The registered proprietor of the land were trustee of Ku Kongsi. The plaintiff's grandfather, uh, who is Cheong's family, had converted the swampy jungle into a productive farm. So when Cheong died, uh, plaintiff number two took over the management of the farm, which was worked on by the family members. He spent 1,500 to build ceiling for the house, but there was no conditions were printed on the rent receipt issued to Cheong. So they spend money because there was um, uh, actually assurance by the um, by the grand uh, by the proprietor that by the Ku Kongsi that they can stay on the land as long as they want based on the promise made by the uh, proprietor. The plaintiffs were all illiterate farmers. Uh, they could not understand the condition which included a condition that of one month's notice it would be sufficient to terminate the tenancy. So it's a tenancy, it's a lease in the land basically, but because the, the plaintiff could not read, so they uh, did not understand about the one condition of the one month's notice to terminate the tenancy. Plaintiff number two was informed by visiting trustee of Ku Kongsi that it was necessary to change the tenancy into her name and that she could continue planting vegetables as long as she wished provided she paid the rent. Cheong has a short P2 uh, that as long as he continued, this is, uh, this is another party it's another promise, 
as long as he continued to pay the ground rent, he could stay and cultivate the farm. And upon his death, the tenancy can continue for the benefit of for the benefit of his family. So based on the assurance, the plaintiff has invested twelve thousand in installing a sprinkler system for the farm for more than fifty years. Uh, and during that period, neither Ku Konsi or anyone else had interfered with the farming activities. But later, Ku Konsi, the trustee of the land, gave one month's notice of termination to the plaintiff. Plaintiff claimed that there were and are lawful protected tenants. Therefore, they were entitled in law and equity to possession of the plot. They sued the uh, defendant for trespass and nuisance. So the cause of action here is trespass and nuisance, but to assert the fact that they have done or they have, the defendant had committed trespass and nuisance, they rely on proprietary estoppel. In this case, the court held that plaintiff number two was a constructive trustee of the farm for the benefit of herself, the other and plenty witness number one. Therefore, plaintiff two could maintain the suit to protect trust property. So basically, the concept of trust, uh, constructive trust, is almost similar to um, almost similar to proprietary estoppel. Here, the trustee, the settlor, had informed uh, to the trustee, who can see that uh, they can stay on the land uh, as long as they want, as long as they pay the ground rent. So they have relied on the promise made by the ancestor. But the issue here is there were illiterate, uh, illiterate farmers, so they did not understand that the, uh, the trustee, uh, the landlord, can issue one month notice to terminate the tenancy. But there was no uh, objection, right, for more than 50 years uh, by the trustee or by the landlord, by the next of kin of the landlord. So, uh, the court further said that the gift of the farm to the plaintiff and plaintiff witness one had been perfected by their possession and cultivation of the farm during Cheong's lifetime. So, what they have done at the encouragement, what they have relied on, have done at the encouragement of the landlord, is considered as a gift or it is considered as a constructive trust. Therefore, it could not be uh, interfered because it has been agreed during the, or it has been perfected during the Cheong's lifetime. So, and on, on estoppel, um, promises and assurance have been made by Ku Konsi first to Cheong that as long as he and his family, Cheong is basically um, the grandfather uh, in the plaintiff's family. So Cheong has died, uh, but the promise stayed because there was no objection for more than 50 years. So Ku Kwansi had told uh, to Cheong that as long as he and his family continue to pay the ground rent, he could stay and cultivate the farm as long as he wanted. So relying on the same, he and his family had converted the farm, the, the swampy jungle into a productive farm. and. Uh, built the dwelling houses with Ku Konsi's consent because there was no objection. So if there was no objection, you cannot, you can be stopped from denying the promise. In fact, there was a reliance because based on the money and substantial uh, spending made based on the assurance. So the court here applied the doctrine of proprietary estoppel, which is similar to constructive trust. Uh, in both proprietary and proprietary estoppel and constructive trust, the claimant must have acted to his detriment in reliance on the belief that he would have, he will obtain an interest and equity uh, on the conscience of the legal owner to prevent him from defeating the common intention. Meaning that the reliance made by the um, by the tenant by the promisee is at the encouragement or at the expectation of the landlord. Therefore, the, um, the tenant who has spent and made improvement on the land should be protected 
against interference as long as he would be prejudiced, meaning that he can be protected from any interference with the land or with any uh, with the termination from the termination of the tenancy. So having regard to the plaintiff and ancestors, Cheong had been living on the plot, cultivating the farm and the substantial farm and gained profit over a period of several decades. They had sufficient satisfaction for their labor and expenditure on, on the plot. Right. Next case is Holly Holding and Chai Him. In this case, LTT was the registered proprietor of the land. He created two charges over the land to bank in 1978. In 1989, the bank obtained an order for sale of the land. And therefore, the land was subject to auction. So the successful bidder was the plaintiff. The plaintiff was then registered as the proprietor of the land. The defendant, who were the occupier in the land, refused to vacate when the plaintiff issued the plaintiff the, the notice to uh, terminate or uh, uh, to quit the land. In this case, the defendant was the licensee of LLT since 1957. The second defendant was a temple on the land. The third to fifth defendant were trustee of the temple. So the issue here, can the defendant invoke on perpetual estoppel against the plaintiff who is the successful bidder now become the registered proprietor of the land. The court held that the, plan, the defendant had a right in personam against LLT, the previous landowner. However, the mistake in this case was the defendant did not lodge a caveat. Therefore, who had a better right? Of course, the person who have a legal title had a better right over a person who have equitable rights, even though in principle defendant had right in equity, but because they are failure to lodge a caveat, therefore the right of the defendant was defeated by the right of the uh, the registered rights of the plaintiff. Okay. Um, please have a look at this case as well. Boasted trading Sneedham Berhad for the details. Yeah. Okay. That's all for the lecture. So then, thank you so much.